old trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Well, welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts, Bill Barley here to do a story. Now, I don't know how we've uh, told stories for so long and have never told this story because this was the famous story of my boyhood on Vancouver Island. Uh, and uh, now, load it up, where are we heading today? Well, actually, Mike, we're going to tell two stories. One is the place you know of, and that's Leech River. And these are, uh, these are kind of interesting stories because I had personal experiences in both of them. And the other one is the famous Sabalis. And that, that area is farther up the island in Esperanza Inland. And the interesting thing is, one was discovered in the 1860s, actually 1864, and this was the Leech River Gold Discovery. And that was a placer gold find, okay? And the other one was Sabalis, and it was discovered in the 1920s. And that's farther up and kind of at that time kind of an unknown part of Vancouver Island on the west side. Yeah. So we're going to be discussing both of these, one in one half and the other in the other half. Okay. And you maintain they were both flukes. Yeah, I think so. Uh, certainly uh, Leech River to a degree and Zabalas most definitely. All right. Two flukes. There's gold out there for you fluky prospectors. We'll tell those stories right after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley traveling to Vancouver Island today for a couple of stories about gold, and you call them flukes. First well, of all, I mean, what makes a fluke? Well, it's an accidental discovery, really, although it was, it was intended to be a discovery expedition. So the, the government of the day decided to launch an expedition under the command of a Lieutenant Leach. And they sent along an artist, a very well-known artist, a superb artist, Frederick Wimper. He was going to be the artist and the illustrator. And they said, go out and see if you can find, this is 1864, any other mineral occurrences on Vancouver Island, whether they be placer or load. Yeah, and, and this was because the Fraser River rush was over, they, it was the deteriorating in the caribou. Yeah, they were declining significantly in the caribou by 1864. It was still high, but they, they thought there was gold all over British Columbia. So this was the expedition to find it, the Vancouver Island Exploration Expedition. And they set out, and not knowing where to go, but they wandered in kind of a north northwesterly direction, got about 10 miles from Victoria, I went up the Souk River and uh, didn't find much on the Souk, maybe a little bit of indication, but not much. It is not a Placer Gold River. And then on kind of an off chance, they decided to turn up an unnamed tributary, which later became known as the Leech. And as they go up this tributary, Mike, they start picking up rather coarse Placer Gold, actually. And, of course, everyone is, is, is amazed because, first of all, the government is paying two-thirds of the cost, and the volunteers with them are paying one-third. So this isn't bad. This is uh, somebody's going to get subsidized. paid back. Okay. Yeah. So they then they start panning and they they find they starting to find half ounce, quarter ounce slugs, uh, one third ounce, uh, two or three grains, and so on. Really quite coarse gold, well worn, but on both sides of the leech. And then they begin st staking their claims all the way up the leech. And before long, and the word is uh, doesn't stay secret for very long mm. when it, when a gold discovery is made, especially when it's, it's free gold like that. So th soon there were hundreds of people on the, on the Leech River. And, and these uh, people, I mean, these people uh, were uh, disenchanted with the caribou, wanted to be first on the scene. Close to Victoria. Close, close to Victoria, and there was a photographer there, Mike, and that's Whoa. what I like about this. There's a photographer there in 1864. That's why some of these photographs are not perfect, but they're pretty good. This is a great photograph. Now, yeah. this is like every river I know on Vancouver Island. Big boulders, yeah. well-worn, been sure. there a long time, and this is where... This well, that one, I guess that's, uh, that's Braze bar. bar, I think. Yeah, I'm looking at it upside down. Braze Bar was typical of, uh, of the, the, the difficulties they had in the Leech River. There's a long tom on that one, and the miners, some of them are waving at the photographer. They have to freeze, by the way, in the Leech. You can just see it on the right-hand side of that photograph. But very, very tough ground to, to mine. Well, how, how do you mine ground like that? These huge boulders weigh a ton apiece. Yeah, well, the, 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 at least the average individual, the novice, will mine the upper end of the, of the boulder as, it nears, as the current is coming down. You actually mine the lower end of the boulder. That's well, where the boulder occurs. So it comes in on that, that kind of that back eddy or that, that back... back uh, uh, that's one little tip that yeah. you've given us today. So that's Braze Bar. Yeah. Found some good stuff on Braze Bar? Yeah, they did. They found uh, uh, probably around a thousand ounces on Bray's Bar, which is pretty good for a uh, for hand miner. This is this is poor man's gold. This is the gold commissioner's camp 
and uh, look at they got the uh, tent set up and yeah. again what a yeah. this was a perfect promoter's dream because oh, of course. photographer there close to victoria yeah. all of the news gets out quick of course it did and of course the government was there very quickly with the gold commissioner and uh, tents are set up here and uh, indicates and uh, look at that and, and the trees of course are uncut in that that particular era and uh, typical of, uh, of a gold commissioner's camp in the 1860s. Look at this batch of prospectors around this log cabin here. I mean, they look like that lonesome bunch, don't they? I mean, there's yeah. uh, the, the beards and the arms crossed, and uh, right. that's one of the first cabins on site. Yeah, I think it is. I think that may be the Mountain Rose, and uh, I'm looking at it upside down, but it looks like it to me. And the chimney itself is actually uh, made of wood it's, uh, as well. And these are typical of the miners of the day. They're Californians, Mike. There's not much doubt about it at all. They're probably soaking wet and sick of it. Yeah, you can tell by their hats. You yeah. know, they have that Stetson, Stetson type hat or the flat brimmed hat. This is the bullion claim. Yeah, the bullion claim is, is quite good. And this is probably, there was the biggest nugget they found on, in this area was was four ounces, Mike. Now, now the, this little baby yeah. I've got in my hand here is not quite an ounce. So four times larger than that. Yeah, to be four times larger than that, it would be, it would be an eye opener. Any Listen, nuggets, this is an know, eye opener to me. This if yeah. this one clanked in my pan, I would yeah. say I'm oh, staying. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, I panned that out of one of my claims, and uh, we panned out bigger ones, but. But actually, any any nugget uh, over uh, two or three penny weight is a clinker in the pan, and then there's a there's a clunker in the pan. That's, <laughs> That's a clunker, a clunker pan, and that okay. four ounce obviously yeah. was Eureka. They heard that sure. all the way to Victoria, sure. and, and that uh, was in the bullion. That was in the bullion claim, and the interesting thing in the bullion claim, you can see two two rockers here which is not the best way to pan in that particular... But some of these guys were fair novices, too, you know. They weren't experienced miners, so they did miss some gold, and I'll tell you more about that later. All right. This is a grocery store of the day. This is uh, Mr. <laughs> Ward's grocery store? Yeah, W. W. Ward and Company. And uh, selling virtually everything. You see some liquor bottles off on the left. There'd be beer bottles. And they would be from Victoria, by the way. And uh, over here, I don't know what this guy has in his hand. You have a weighing scales there and some goods. And... Um, Several, several of them smoking pipes, which was typical of a miner in the day, and some flowers sitting there. And uh, uh, pretty rude, pretty crude, but uh, would do for the time. Making money. He was there first. He was there first and making money. Here's these guys are again, and look at, there's a man swinging a pick in this. This is an action shot, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Yeah, they're posing in 1860. You mean that guy's holding that pick over his head just while the guy's saying, hold that shot, hold That's it? That's right, he is, indeed. <laughs> and the guy's doing the same thing with the shovel. So these, uh, these five Trojans are there looking for gold, and they'll probably get some in that spot, but they'll have to get under the boulders first and get down to bedrock where most of the gold is. I can just, there's, I can almost hear them good-natured. Have you that shot taken yeah. yet? Have you got any film in that thing? I yeah. mean, they were rocking. Well, what they think is, they, they think they're in another, in another caribou. Yeah. Remember, it didn't have film. It had a glass plate negative. I know, okay. I know. I was kind of th trying <laughs> okay. to think of what the, the duplicate of that might have been. Now, this shot here, this after oh, a yeah. hard day's work, yeah. you, you retreated to the local bar. That's Lazelle's retreat, and, uh, that's, and that's what he calls it. And uh, rather interesting, there's a woman in, in, in the photograph, and I wonder why she is there, because it's unusual. She's quite dressed up. And right next to the, to the first tent on the, tent on the right-hand side is a, is a grinding wheel or grindstone, and it says two bits per grind. So if you had a, an ax that needed sharpening, you had a pick that needed sharpening, or even a shovel occasionally needed sharpening, you went to Lazell's retreat. But his main, his main selling um, point was wines, liquors, and cigars. There no is. doubt about it. I mean, all. this is so new that yeah. they hadn't even put up the clapboard houses That's yet. This right. was, this was uh, first, first come, first serve. You bet. That's amazing. You bet. Look at this great big pool here. Now, this reminds me, too, of a lot of Vancouver Island places. Yeah, it does. It's, it's a beautiful river, actually, Mike, and uh, this is a pool, they thought, and these guys go out in a raft in 1864, and they're looking for gold in the bottom of the pool. Well, first of all, gold does not usually occur in the bottom of the pool except where the, where the stream or river comes in at the top would carry the gold, and then it deposits immediately. It doesn't carry along the bottom of the pool. So um, this is kind of a for, forlorn exercise for these two uh, greenhorns. Now, how would they, what would they try and do? Drain the pool and then uh, and mine what they could get down to? Yeah, but you wouldn't even do that. It wouldn't be worthwhile. Only place you would mine is where the entrance of, of the stream comes right into the pool. That's the only place. And you see a lot of sand there and fine gravels. That's not a good place to look for gold. All right. That's the deep pool. Here we've got, now, this, you mentioned that there was a guy named Wimper along uh, on, yeah. this, on this trip. And this is a sketch of... 
Uh, I the guess Burke's Hotel, yeah. yeah. And it, it looks like a whimper, but I'm not sure. And I haven't got the details on this. I have, an, I have a whimper painting, but... And he was very, very good, and he was very accurate, what he painted. And um, so this is, this is the first substantial hotel <laughs> in, in the Leech River District. Not a big operation, as you can see. And this is the, the old ass... Hey, sorry? And there's a couple of other things here. First of all, you know, they have a place to, 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 to tie your horse up, of course. A uh, hitching, hitching rope. And uh, then you have the grinding stone over here, which is always necessary for a hotel. So that gathered people to the hotel. Would probably be two bits of drink. Shake, uh, shake Roof Hotel, but it was a mistake. It Why? was a mistake because the Leech River rush really didn't last very long, Mike. The total, the total amount of gold they took out of the Leech River was somewhere around six to 7,000 ounces. Now, that sounds like a, like a lot, and that is a fair amount, but that's about all. Yeah. Now, you went there yourself on Vancouver Island. Yeah. Now, I remember the Leech River because uh, I only know it because the uh, bottle hunters and pot hunters yeah. went there. Uh, that was a popular thing to do. Yeah. Uh, you took a class there. <laughs> yeah. About 15 years ago, Mike, I was teaching placer mining in Victoria. Uh, and uh, I said, well, where we go? Well, I said, I've never looked at the Leech. I'd been on about 200 streams in British Columbia, streams and rivers, looking for placer gold and enjoyed the company of the streams. And, thought, okay, we'll go up the leech. And uh, so I took about 100 people along, if I remember correctly. And first of all, I looked at the map of the leech. And it was, there was a fork as you go well up the leech. And I thought, that looks kind of interesting to me. And it wasn't a topographical map. It was a geological map. So I couldn't tell the, the heights and so on. But I said, that looks like the right formation. And um, so I went to see the owner of that lease, a guy named Waters in downtown Victoria, who had a machine shop, if I remember correctly. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Waters, I said, could we... Uh, could I take a placer mining class up there? He says, yeah, Bill, I don't think there's very much there. I said, well, I said, M there may not be. I said, but uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I said, they, they can keep what they always share. He said, they can keep what they get. He was a very generous guy, very nice man. And um, so anyway, I took this class up there. This is uh, early, fairly early morning. We got up there about, I guess, about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. And so we went up the leech and we kept on going. I didn't stop anywhere. I wanted to go to the spot where I, where I'd looked at. And we crossed over that one little tributary and then came down and crossed the other little tributary so we didn't have to cross the main leech. And I said, okay, this looks like some, some bedrock in here, some, some surface bedrock and some rim rock. And I said, go right down, right down to the bottom of the, of the bedrock. And I said, it isn't very far to dig here, three or four, three or four inches in some places, a foot in another place. And, and, I, and I was rather surprised, to be quite candid. We started picking up small nuggets like that immediately. And uh, I've never seen people so industrious. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they made wages or not, but I left at about, it was uh, early fall, and I left at about 6.30 at night, I think it was, maybe 7 o'clock, Mike, and I was amazed because I looked across the river and some of them were still panning using flashlights. <laughs> now, that's determination. That's gold. <laughs> yeah. that's gold. Did you tell Mr. Waters he might have more on his claim than he realized? Yeah, I did. I said I showed him where an old run was. I hadn't, I hadn't tested the run. There was an old oxidized run in there, Mike, but I hadn't tested it. All righty. That's the Leech River. Uh, not a long operation, but obviously you can return to these sometimes and uh, get a surprise. Coming back in just a moment to take you to the north end of the island for another fluky find of gold. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts, Bill Barley on Vancouver Island. Our second big fluke occurs oh. in Zabalis, you say? Yeah, purely accidental on Esperanza Inlet. And uh, I, I got the story in a strange way, Mike. I'm teaching in Port Alice in 1956. And I go down to the bank, and the bank manager says to me, he says, Bill, he says, I hear you're interested in history. I said, that's true. He said, well, there's an old man dying in the Port Alice Hospital. I think you should go and see him. I said, what's his name? He says, his name is Ilstad, and he's an old fisherman. So I said, okay, I will. I was 22 years old. So I, I walk down there, and I, uh, I go, in and s go up to the hospital, and indeed he's in bad shape, but he's very coherent. And I said, Mr. Ilstad, uh, I understand that, uh, that you have a mining story to tell me. I said, Zabalis. So he, then he proceeds uh to tell me about Zabalis. And he said, we were, we were fishing, and he came from the northern part of Vancouver Island, a lot of Scandinavians up there. 
And they were beating their way down the west side of Vancouver Island and caught one of those westerly storms. And they can be horrific off there. And they had to seek harbor and they had to seep it quickly. So they went into Esperanza Inlet and went down the inlet a little ways and then got into a little bay. And this is the little bay right here. This is where, this is where the gold discoveries were made very close to this, Mike. Okay. And uh, they had to hunker down and then wait out the storm. And they waited for several days and they were getting tired of sitting on the boat, so they decided to take to shore. And they went up the nearest river, which was the Zabalus River. Now, there had been a little placer gold discovered in the Zabalus in 1908, but they weren't looking for placer gold. They had no pans with them, you know, for placer gold pans anyway. And they found some free gold in kind of a greenstone, and a lot of it, three, inch, three and four inch veins, and it was obviously free gold, even to the uninitiated eye. So they began staking, and they staked very, very, very heavily all through that area, kind of like greenhorns would stake, but it stood up in the court of law. And then they began to sell them. And uh, Ilstad said, you know, he said, we were, we were really living high off the hog. He said, we had uh, gold-plated fixtures, doorknobs and, uh, and bathroom fixtures and everything. He said, they were gold-plated. And he said, of course, as the years wore on and we had a little, little uh, uh, came in some tough times, he said, we had to take those gold-plated fixtures down to, the, uh, down to Victoria, he said, and, and, and give them to the pawn shop for what they'd give us. Mm -hmm. And he said, the one thing I remember very, very closely, he said, was uh, kind of interesting. He said, we put a couple of charges in there with dynamite, I guess, eventually after they staked the claims. And he said, as it blew up, he said, and this is, these are, this is quartz and greenstone, he said, we could see the gold actually coming down. Well, that was definitely <laughs> an exaggeration. And that's what his mind had done, done I, I guess, over the year, relived that experience. But it was spectacular. And in the 1920s, a lot of people came in. And here's an example of how good this, this claim was. It says, uh, this, is, this is by an individual called Malmberg and Nordstrom, also two in Scandinavian. It's yep. very interesting. They're two miles upriver. And then it says this, at the time of my examination, Malmberg was working on a small stringer, that's a small quartz vein, up to three or four inches wide, that's about all. It was carrying galena, zinc blend, pyrotite, and calcopyrite, and it assayed up to 40 ounces to the ton. He had six sacks there, he thought there'd be 20 ounces to the ton in those sacks, which was very, very good indeed. How many now? Th now we start getting into these, yeah. uh, I guess, the lo location. Yeah. And uh, so we've got, first of all, this little photograph here is uh, a privateer. That's yeah. one, that was a, going to be one of the big mines. <laughs> yeah, and it's, 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 it's upriver farther even yet. Now, there are a whole bunch of mines in there, Mike. Yep. There was the Answer, and there was the Golden Peak, and there was the, uh, the, the Golden Gate, and there was the, uh, and the, um, and the Van, Van, Van Isle, and a whole bunch of different mines in there, Mike. There, there were so many groups of mines, there were literally dozens and dozens and dozens. And what attracted them there was the free gold in the quartz, which you could see with the naked eye. This is the entrance to the privateer. This is about 37 or 38. Three of the miners there, and they look pretty happy, so they've hit some pretty good ore. Equipment starts rolling in. Of course, this would all have to be served by boat. This oh, is course. the only way into this yeah. country. Only way it comes in is by water, and there's some old, old equipment, and that's about 1938, and look at the territory. Those roads are in very rough shape. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a rain area. Well, here's Main Street, I guess, and uh, <laughs> that's what Main Street is. It had to be boards. You couldn't drive on the ground, so you... That's right. Uh, and all the stores were on pilings, you know, and it's, uh, it's really quite amazing. That's about 1938, so that's Main Street, and they called the towns of Ballas after the river. Now, I love the fact that they didn't call this street any of the traditional avenues. It wasn't called West Avenue or Hamilton Avenue or Governor General's Avenue. It was called May West Avenue. May a, West and Avenue. It was the 1930s, and they, the miners at this particular time were much more interested in May West than they were in the various <laughs> political dignitaries well, anywhere across the country. Well, they hadn't served them too well because they'd just come through the, uh, the uh, recession, the depression, yeah. and so uh, they weren't going to respect anybody That's except right. May West. And look at, look at that. That yeah. is rough country. Yeah, it is. Definitely. And they start hitting, Mike. They really start hitting. And here's, the, here's one of the pictures, one of the photographs of the privateer camp, pretty substantial. Had about 130 men up there, if I remember correctly. And they are in full operation right now. And here's what they get, and they get some absolute dandy stuff. Now, this is an amazing photograph. Yeah. Tell us what we're looking. And these guys are all looking pretty happy. <laughs> oh, they're looking very happy. Shareholders are happy when yeah. things come, pa uh, come to pass. They just can't help smiling. And this is the, these are the first gold bricks poured out of the privateer, 1938. There's probably at least half a ton of pure gold in this, and uh, that half a ton really makes the privateer mine. There were other mines that produced, but the privateer was definitely the best. Now, those 
you can see those gold, what do you call them, ingots? Ingots, ingots yeah. right there? Sure. Now, they would be about what size? Oh, they would be, those would be about 10 inches by about 4 inches by about 3 inches deep. Yeah. So they're, they're probably 150 pounds each, somewhere around that. And there are 11 of them there, Mike. There are 11 bars there. So very, over half a ton, edging onto a ton of gold. A couple artifacts to show you. By comparison, this is just a, a little muffin tin for gold. Sure. But this is where you would ladle your molten gold sure. into here, and this is where it would set. Yeah, that's right. But this would be an ass assay would use this, kind of for a crude assay. You could use it. You could get a button of gold out of that. And yeah. the buttons are produced like that, and I should have brought a couple along with me, which I didn't. Now, the button, this would not be filled with gold. It would just no, be a little button down right. in the yeah. bottom. Button, gold, button of silver, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever mm -hmm. mineral you're after. Now, is this uh, the, the kind of ladle you would ladle yeah, the molten could, gold Yeah, it could be in ladled there? into that. That's right. And look yeah. at that. So that would be... That would be the, the ladle you'd use. But before you'd go to that, oh, of course. it would all be mortared. Sure. So you'd take a piece of ore and yeah. you'd crush it up in here. Yeah. And the ore came in two different types. It came in that zinc, zinky type ore, which was this type of ore, Mike, you know. But and, and if there was and it was calco, if there's calcopyrite in that and pyrite and so on, that would have gold and the gold values would be quite high. They wouldn't be too concerned about the silver. No. They were definitely concerned about the gold. And there were lots of stringers there, Mike, that averaged uh, six, eight, ten ounces to the ton, and uh, that's that's amazing. So that was now, really when I think back to that photograph again, a half a ton of gold in 1938. Uh, over half a ton, I think. Yeah. Worth uh, what was it? What we were well, $18 at 38, an ounce? 30, $35 dollars an ounce. It increased. Yeah. Okay. So that is a find and a half. Oh yeah, all the shareholders did extremely well, which they don't always do in mining operations. And here we have our last shot of uh, Zabalus yeah. Main Street. And this is a much more sedate look than the oh, uh, than the May West Avenue that yeah, we saw a minute it's, ago. It's it's pretty well settled now, and you can see uh, you can see a couple of cars on Main Street, three or four cars on Main Street, Mike. You yep. can, people are well dressed. There are children there, and uh, and probably women in the camp. And Zabalus by that time is well established. Now we haven't talked about Gold River, which is in that same yeah. general area. Yeah. I mean, was. Uh, was that associated with this claim, or is that an all another story? Well, not usually. Anytime you come across a creek called Gold Creek or Gold River, usually there isn't much gold in it, which is surprising. There may be just enough to get your interest, but seldom. Uh, I can't think of any Gold River or any Gold Creek that was rich in British Columbia, and a lot of them have been named that, Mike. Very interesting. So if, you've, uh, if you're planning on investing in something, don't always go to where it's called Gold River. Isn't that whim the wonderful whimsy of this? You're yeah. teaching as a 22-year-old with his ears open and an appreciation yeah. for history, and Mr. Ilstad tells you the story, yeah. including the gold flakes raining down <laughs> after the explosion. Yeah, he was quite a guy. And I got him just in time, Mike, because he passed on within the week. And uh, it was quite an experience. I can visualize it right now. All right. Very Th interesting, man. Thank you very much for today. A couple of fluky finds, uh, according to Bill. Uh, the Leech River find on southern Vancouver Island, just 10 miles away from Victoria, and Zabalis, a uh, much later claim, found in the 20s, developed in the 30s, and uh, great stories on gold trails and ghost towns. See you next time on Gold Trails.